So I'll be talking about some work that was initiated during my PhD at Warwick. Um, it's joint work with Paul Jenkins, Eric Koskala and Dario Spano, all three of whom are based at Warwick. Um, and I don't think I need to convince you that there's been a boom in the amount of genetic data that's become available to us nowadays. Um, it's not on, only in the form of biobanks and new species being sequenced, it's also um, advancements in the technologies used to extract DNA from remains have uh, improved and now we get access to um, time series data coming from ancient DNA. So this is uh, what you can see over here is um, a data set from Ludwig et al from 2009, so it's uh, quite a bit old nowadays. Um, but this is basically five different excavation sites where archaeologists found remains of horses. They could date them via ra uh, radiocarbon dating to get the x-axis over there. Um, and were able to extract DNA from that stuff and figure out what these things actually are. So these are the different alleles coding for different horse coat colors. So for instance, I don't really know what actual color they code for, but you could imagine this being a black horse and this being a yellow horse and so on. Um, and by uh, sort of putting these things temporarily together in time, you get these plots over here where you have changes in allelic frequencies over time. So if we look at the ASIP, which is this dark blue, you can see that it increased from roughly 5% um, 13,000 years ago up to 75% over the span of 10,000 years. And if you sort of just look at this data, you might think, oh, there might be some clue here that some form of selection is happening. And you might want to run some kind of inference to back that up. So this is the starting point where we sort of came in and said, OK, what can we do? How can we create some kind of inferential scheme that will tackle this problem? Uh, but of course, we we're not the first ones to get there. There's been quite a lot of work done, um, starting from 2008. So it's a very recent stuff. Um, but it goes down all the way to 2020. Um, this is a selective um, display of the literature out there. I've definitely missed some apologies to them, um, but it's still very active. And one sort of unifying thing about all the sources over here is that all the methods they use rely on some kind of discretization or approximation to get to the output you need. Uh, the only exception is this number 17, which actually develops an exact scheme uh, using filtering, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, and the problem with discretization is, of course, that you introduce a bias into your output. And it's very hard to, to quantify that bias if you don't know what the ground truth really is. So what we wanted to do is to try and figure out, well, can we do a bit better, given that Paul and Dario had figured out how to simulate exactly from the right Fisher diffusion. Um, and I'll go into that shortly. But first, I'll just introduce the sort of probabilistic setting so I'm going to assume that my allele frequencies are modeled by this right Fisher diffusion. Uh, it's an SDE. You've got the uh, drift over here. So you've got a selection coefficient acting over there. You've got your mutation parameters over there, making sure that your process is ergodic. And you've got the genetic drift coming up in the diffusion coefficient. Um, and our goal is going to be to infer the selection coefficient sigma and the allele age T naught. Uh, based on some noisy observations YTI, which are driven by this diffusion. So when I say noisy, I mean that they're going to be some kind of binomial draws. So this cartoon is sort of an, a way to try and understand the, the sampling framework we're living win, within. So in gray, this path is your right Fisher diffusion. X is latent. It's not observed. It's at the population level frequencies evolving through time. But uh, from the archaeological remains, we can extract some kind of samples from the data they have over there, right? And these, we, draw, we, we model them as being binomial draws whose success probability is actually given by the population frequency at those times, OK? OK, so the, the, the data we're actually working with is just this, these kinds of counts over there. So um, now I do a so, sort of slight diversion and look at what do I mean when I say exact simulation for the right Fisher diffusion. Um, so this next bit is really work that Paul and Dario did in 2017 and actually showing that you can um, simulate from this exactly. And when I say simulate exactly, I mean that there's no kind of discretization coming into play. So when you're generating a draw, you're generating it from the law of the diffusion itself, not an approximation to the diffusion. And really this um, sort of 
technique relies on this transition density decomposition that's been around since the 80s, so that's quite a lot of time, 50 years now. Um, but if you approach it, so if you, if you just sit down and look at this from a simulation perspective, it sort of becomes quite clear how you should proceed, right? You've got a beta and a binomial there, standard to draw samples from that. The only remaining thing is this QM here, which turns out to be a mixed, mixture distribution on it. So conceptually, I could simulate draws from the neutral uh, right Fisher diffusion if I knew how to simulate from this M, because then, sorry, from these QMs, because then if I do simulate that random variable conditional on that draw, I can draw a binomial, I can draw a beta, and the output of the beta is the right thing that I need. But this is all the work that Paul and Dario did. So um, it turns out you can do all this. The main bottleneck is figuring out how to do this sampling. Um, and the trick there is really this alternating series trick. Um, I'll point you towards Luke DeVroy's book if you're interested in that. Uh, full details over there. OK, but this is how to generate samples from the neutral transition density. What about the non-neutral one? And unsurprisingly, you can't really do the same technique over here because selection will introduce some kind of um, intractable terms, which I will uh, show you in a later slide. What you can do, however, is consider a change of measure. So you can look at the rod and derivative between the law of a non-neutral diffusion, so that's this right Fisher sigma over there, and the law of a neutral diffusion process. And because we have tools like Gersanov's transform, we know exactly what that looks like. And essentially, it's an exponential that involves some polynomials. And it's polynomials because, so for the case of non-neutral uh, for the non-neutral right Fisher, we're lucky because we get these polynomials coming up. And that will pr prove to be crucial uh, for the next bit. So the next bit is what's called the exact algorithm, which was pioneered by Beskos Roberts uh, in a string of papers, 2005, 6, and 8. And there, so their starting point was choosing a candidate process. In that case, it was Brownian motion, because that's nice and easy, it's just a Gaussian, figuring out what this rather Nicodem derivative looks like, and then looking at this thing as the probability of some event that we can simulate in finite time. And in this case, if we look at the right-hand side over here, if we look at this second exponential over there, we realize that this is nothing else but the probability that this Poisson point process of unit rate on 0t cross whatever that is has no points under the graph of this map. We have this extra exponential here, but that's just a coin flip, right? So what's this really telling us? Well, I know how to draw from the neutral right Fisher diffusion. If I augment my state space with this Poisson point process, I can generate points from this guy. So I'll generate a draw from this neutral thing. I will simulate a Poisson point process. I'll check that all the points are above this. And if that's the case, I've generated a draw from the non-neutral diffusion. If not, I just go back and re regenerate, uh, generate once more a draw from the neutral right Fisher diffusion. OK, um, and we've recently made this available on GitHub. Um, if anyone wants to play around with it, it should be quite straightforward to, to get it to run on your machines. OK, but this was all like exact simulation. I started out talking about inference. So this is where I try and make the inferential setup a bit clearer. Um, a first approach to the problem would be to say, well, I want to target the posterior di distribution of sigma and t naught given these noisy observations. And your first approach might be, well, OK, let me just marginalize out the latent path that I don't know or have access to. And the problem, as I alluded to earlier, is that this transition density for the non neutral right fissure is intractable. Um, so there's no way you can actually evaluate this, even if I knew what the values of the diffusion were at the sampling times. So how about if I just augment the state space with the latent path, then I can just drop this integral, but I'm still in a bit of a soup because I still don't know how to play around with this guy over here. So a first approach might be to say, OK, well, how about we just discretize and use some kind of euler mariama scheme to generate these draws over here? And there's a couple of reasons why um, that might turn out to be not too great an idea. The first one is, as I've mentioned earlier, discretization induces a bias. And of course, you could argue that, well, if you just take a 
uh, really fine discretization, then the bias is going to be very, uh, very small. But your computational cost is really going to soar. So you might want to try and avoid that. Secondly, um, we have a process that lives in a closed interval 0, 1. Euler Mariyama doesn't care about that. It will just generate points outside of it. And of course, you could tell me, all right, there's been uh, improvements in Euler Mariyama for, uh, to respect this kind of boundary behavior. You're just going to have an increase in computational cost down the line. And finally, th this kind of scheme really is going to generate x conditional on sigma t naught. It's not going to give us the dependence on y. If I know that 90% of my samples have the allele, there's no reason why I should be proposing values that are close to zero, right? It's highly unlikely that that is the case. Okay, but I told you that we can sim simulate from this exactly, right? So you might tell me, well, why are you going through all this rubbish when you could just do a metropolis within Gibbs? And the answer is that, okay, you could do it, but then you're going to get a problem when you want to update your selection coefficient and your allele age because essentially your acceptance probabilities are going to involve ratios of products of these guys. And you could employ something like a pseudo-marginal um, update over there, but your resulting algorithm is going to be very sticky, you're going to have very poor mixing, and your re results are going to be pretty rubbish. So that's a bit of a bummer, but we can actually work a bit harder to get something better. And to do this, we actually go back to the exact sampling algorithm and see what that can give us. So, Previously, I showed you the Radon Nicodem derivative, and if you sort of play around with that, you can get this decomposition for the non neutral transition density. And this involves three terms. So you've got the neutral transition density, which, if you recall, was an infinite sum. So if you actually wanted to evaluate it, you have to truncate, you have to discretize. But um, the alternating series trick gives you a way to bound this from above and below by uh, monosonically converging upper and lower sums. So even if these guys did turn up in our acceptance probabilities, that's fine because once I know what uh, the once I've generated the uniform for my acceptance probability, I can get envelopes that will converge to the right distribution, and I can keep on um, updating these envelopes up until I can make a, de uh, a decision whether to accept or reject. The exponential here is nice and easy. These are all functions that we know. Phi sigma is a polynomial. I can figure out what the minimum is. This guy, this guy's a beast. It's a path integral, and it's an average over the space of continuous functions. I don't want to evaluate that. So can we do something to get rid of it? And the answer is yes. If you look at the density of the accepted Poisson points within this exact sampler, it turns out that this quantity is in the denominator. So if we augment our state space, with the latent path and with this Poisson point process, these two things are going to cancel out. And I'm just left with things that I know how to work with. And so now this is amazing, right? Because I could just augment my state space with this and be, be done with. So I can just run my metropolis within Gibbs. Not so fast. There's a problem there. Um, the dumb, because we're going to be using a metropolis within Gibbs, we need to make sure that our algorithm is going to be mixing. And for it to mix, we need to make sure that the dominating measure doesn't depend on any of the things that we're actually going to be simulating. And it turns out that this Poisson point process depends on the allele age t naught. This right Fisher diffusion bridge measure depends on x and y, which are going to be the uh, values of the diffusion at the sampling times. But it's not too hard to just play around with some changes in measures and consider, consider thinning for Poisson point processes to actually decouple this dependence on those quantities. And the end result is a joint density given over here. And so we have an exponential with functions we know how to work with. We've got a binomial density, which is fine. And we've got a product of things that we know how to work with. All terms are computable. Great. The dominating measure does not depend on any of the things that we're simulating. Right? This is a post the unit rate Poisson point process on the real positive line. This is on a uh, Poisson point process of unit rate over t1 up to tn, and this is the law of a right Fisher diffusion started from zero. So this is all great. We can work with this. The next question is, how do you update? And this is a bit of a more um, subtle thing, because we've worked really hard to try and get the, like, the right likelihood over there. You might want to be a bit careful to not introduce things that are going to screw you over further down the line. Okay, so 
I will illustrate how to do internal path updates, um, convince you that this is roughly the same for the end path updates, and then try and illustrate why initial path updates are a bit more tricky, um, and then go on to the case study and show you some results. So for internal path updates, what we're going to do is we're going to fix two time intervals from ti minus 1 up to ti and from ti up to ti plus 1. We're going to fix the left-hand point and the right-hand point to be some fixed values. And we're going to draw xti from the law of right fisher diffusion bridge going from xi minus 1 up to xi plus 1 over the time interval ti plus 1 minus ti minus 1 sampled at time ti. And the density of the point we generate is going to be given by this. right? And this is a product and ratio of these annoying um, transition densities. Then what we're going to do is we're going to fill the Poisson points to the left and to the right of that point. And as I've already showed you earlier, the nice thing is that this guy is going to cancel out with the annoying guy from here, and this guy is going to cancel out with this guy. And we're going to be left with nice, tractable things. But you might tell me, what about this annoying quantity in the denominator, that actually doesn't depend on any of the things that we've simulated and the acceptance probability is going to cancel out. So this is going to give us exact updates. Once I simulate my x, my phi i and phi i plus and accept them, I can, uh, you can sort of put the maths together and figure out that the acceptance probability is 1, which just means that I have an exact path update. And it's not hard to see how you would sort of extend this to the rightmost point where you don't have to condition on an extra point to the right. You just do the same thing, condition on this guy, propose this, and then fill in the Poisson points. For the initial path update, it's a bit harder. Because for the initial path update, what you have to do first is to change this guy. This, was, this would be t naught, and you'd have to move it somewhere new based on the proposal you have. And then do this whole um, thing that we've done over here with choosing the point and then filling the Poisson points to the left and to the right. And now in this case, this is where this transition density is going to be a problem because this now depends on T0, right? This Ti minus 1 is going to be T0. I'm going to have two different T0s that I need to run an acceptance probability for. So I'm going to have a ratio of these guys and I don't really know what to do. And this is where we um, run a pseudo marginal update for this particular thing, where we use the uh, Poisson estimator to get handles on this sort of quantity over there. Okay, so we've run this through a simulation study. So I've generated draws from the right Fisher diffusion. That's the blue plot over there. Uh, the parameters are up here. Um, and then I've superimposed uh, binomial sampling to get the red dots over there. And this is what we feed into the algorithm. And the posterior looks something like this for sigma. So on the First plot, this is my prior, so I started with a minus 10, 10, completely bad prior. Uh, the truth was actually 10. Um, the circles are the likelihood evaluations, and the black is my kernel smoothed posterior. And as you can see, the likelihood has pulled um, the posterior towards the truth, and the likelihood is concentrating around the truth. So there is confidence over here that our method is performing as it should. Um, you can look at the trace plot and that the autocorrelation function and sort of deduce that we have nice mixing, so all is nice and good. What about for the allele age? Well, here the picture is a bit less clear. Um, the likelihood seems to be a lot flatter than it did for the previous plot. This is to be expected. We didn't think that there would be much signal in the data to be able to say much about the allele age to start with. Nonetheless, the mixing is relatively OK, and I, I would have said this was the best we could have hoped for. Um, from what we had. Um, OK, so that brings me to a close. Uh, in summary, so we've developed this exact uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm that targets the exact posterior of sigma t naught. We've done this via state space augmentation and using the exact algorithm for the right Fisher diffusion. Um, and the main point is that we don't need any kind of discretization. The posterior I was showing you before is the true posterior of both sigma and t naught. Um, so this has all been implemented in C++. The results for the simulated data sets seem to be quite encouraging. Our plan is to actually apply this to real data sets. Um, and finally, we're also thinking about extending this to infer the mutation rates and demography and other parameters that are in, of interest for uh, geneticists. The problem, however, is that this sigma, if you recall, 
showed up in the dominating measure and it's not immediately clear how you would decouple that dependence over there. Um, and I think I'll stop there because lunch is on the way. Happy to take any questions. All right, well, thank you very much for that talk. Uh, questions? Hi. Um, my question is, um, it's just that part of that, uh, of what you do could be, could be extended to other um, SDE models. So what's the limitation? What, what, the, what the, where is the place where you um, might find troubles in that? Um, so I think it's, the exact algorithm, right, is the main bottleneck. Um, so let's go back. Something like this. Um, you need to have a process that you can simulate from exactly relatively easily. On the real line, you could use something like Brownian motion. But if you move away from any process that doesn't live on all of R, then you need to find the right candidate process to be running over there. In the case of the right Fisher diffusion, we were saved because we could actually simulate from the neutral right Fisher diffusion. But if you had something like an einstein ullenbach process that is on the positive half line, then you might want to find something that respects that boundary behavior and gives you the right thing. Okay, thanks. So the last figures you showed, they were for the horse data? Uh, no, so those were the simulation data set that I sort of artificially put together where so we how, knew... How does it work for the horse data? Sorry? How does it work for the horse data? Haven't applied it yet. Oh, I see. Yeah, so in the pipeline. Hi, thank you so much for the great talk. Uh, also, very impressive method. Uh, hard job probably to present this. <laughs> But um, so my question is about, I mean, so that there are various steps involved, it seems, uh, in sort of actually running this inference exactly. And I'm just curious about the comparison, whether or not you have a comparison to this sort of more discretized versions of, of this inference, sort of how much do you gain in terms of, uh, especially when it's difficult to, as you mentioned, it's difficult to know what the biases are and also how do the computational costs compare in, in, in sort of those two inference approaches? Yeah, so this is something we were planning to do. Um, the horse coat coloration data set, I've chosen it because it's already featured in three or four different sources. So you can get quite a good comparison over there. The only problem is I think they assume a different underlying model. So in one of them, there is no mutation and the other there is. So it might be a bit tricky to fully get the sort of comparisons going because they're um, competing different things. But yes, it is something that we plan to, to, to address. I, I'm not super familiar with this at all, but it seems like the, the, the most challenging bit is to actually solve the right Fisher model exactly and do that in, in, in an inference way. My initial question was when you showed these allele frequencies, and I'm not sure what, what kind of how this data is collected, but could it be that the measurements, even though you might find multiple... Um, the question is around sort of how do you determine these allele frequencies? So I'm imagining sort of maybe you find uh, somewhere sites where you have yeah. multiple horses and then you sort of collect the DNA. But of course, these allele frequencies locally could have some correlation or whatever. So it could be, and I, I don't know, it looks for me like this could be easily extended by just uh, sort of changing this binomial to something being more correlated or whatever. And would that straightforwardly work with your inference approach also? Yeah, I mean, essentially changing the binomial would just change this quantity over here, right? So that's, it should be relatively straightforward. Um, yeah, I mean, essentially, these some of these uh, excavation sites need not be geographically very close. Um, so there is the question of, you, well, you're kind of assuming that they're coming from the same population when you're doing this. Um, but yeah, that's something that we've not really spent too much time thinking about, but it is yeah something to keep in mind. Hey, any any other questions? No, well, in that case, I think it's uh, pretty much lunchtime. So let's thank Yari once uh, once again, and in, in fact, uh, all of the speakers for this session. Thank you.